Okay, Glenn, so last week, Donald Trump had his worst week ever. That's legally speaking. Because several judges ruled against him up and down in state and with local courts. In short order, he'll now be forced to sit for a deposition in the ongoing Trump Organization investigation. In addition, the civil cases that have filed against him now by Eric Swalwell and Benny Thompson will go forward with the presiding judge, uh, Amit Mehta, all but saying in open court that Trump was guilty. So let's start with the bigger picture here. Do you see a Trump indictment in the near future? And if so, for which investigation? You know, Michael, I'm not a betting man. One dollar is my betting limit. I'm not a high roller, but I would bet a buck that Donald Trump will be indicted. Now, where will he be indicted first? Georgia, New York, by the feds? I think that is an open question. But based on the evidence that has been amassed against him, based on what the judiciary, both state and federal, is saying about his behavior and the evidence in support of both civil suits and criminal charges, I cannot envision uh, a scenario where Donald Trump is not indicted. I happen to believe he's going to be indicted both in state jurisdictions and federally. You know, when you see what Judge Engeron said, about the civil fraud investigation up in New York being run by Attorney General Tish James. Michael, I've been involved in a lot of motions to quash subpoenas. They are relatively run-of-the-mill motions. And ordinarily, judges resolve them by issuing you know, a, a one-page opinion saying either it's a well-placed subpoena or it's not. When I saw Judge Engeron, say that he personally had reviewed thousands of documents that had been subpoenaed by Attorney General James. And then he went on to say that she, quote, uncovered copious evidence of possible financial fraud. Judges don't ordinarily talk that way in motions to quash subpoenas. That was a remarkable tell and then he went on to say, if Tish James had not investigated this and had not subpoenaed Trump and Don Jr. and Ivanka, it would have been, quote, a dereliction of duty. I mean, what more do we need to know about the coming civil fraud case that I think will mark the end of the Trump organization? And then if we shift down to D.C., Judge Mehta, who I have to say was a, a local PDS defense attorney in the courts of Washington, D.C., when I was prosecuting, highly regarded jurist, um, when he said, and I quote, Donald Trump's conduct was the essence of civil conspiracy, and he allowed the lawsuit to go forward against Donald Trump for inciting the insurrection, in essence, we, you know, the Department of Justice has every conceivable roadmap. I mean, they have a GPS mapped out for them. They just have to follow it to a criminal indictment. You know, for me, I sort of was curious whether or not uh, it was Engeron who made the decision, uh, you know, because most of the time as you see what goes on in the courts right now because of COVID, uh, because of the backlog in the system, despite the fact this is obviously a high profile case. I mean, that ruling came three days after that um, Mazers, Trump's longtime accounting firm, cut ties with Donald uh, and the Trump organization and in essence redacted and retracted a decade's worth of his financial statements, telling Donald not to use them and that any time that he does use them, that people should know that they are not to be relied upon. I wonder how much that played in the expeditiousness of this decision. Well, other than the fact that, that, that it's legitimate, yeah, other than the, the fact that it's that legitimate. Sentence. The one thing that signaled to me is that Mazars is on the, the government train right now. They don't want to get run over by the train. They jumped on the train. They're probably trying to mitigate their own damage, if any. I will hasten to add, I don't know what Mazars was or was not doing with the garbage numbers the Trump Organization was providing them, but it kind of smells like they made the calculated decision that if we want to survive this, we need to cooperate, even if we perhaps have a little bit 
of exposure. So yeah, that's another really ominous sign. And I don't know if Donald Trump is sitting in the reception room of an H&R block right now, waiting to have his taxes done. I don't know who's doing his taxes for him. So supposedly there's some firm in Dallas, Texas, that decided to take on. I mean, to me, I think that automatically creates for them a massive malpractice, um, you know, liability insurance premium increase, you know, so to speak. But I'll tell you, I agree with you. Uh, and we already know that Donald Bender, who was the point person for Mazers, has already met with the grand jury here in New York. I believe both for the DA and the AG's case. Um, not sure about the day, but I know um, from what I've read, uh, definitely for the AG's case. And I started to reflect upon, I know Donald Bender for well, well in excess of a decade and a half. Literally since I first started, he was a constant figure around the office, especially um, several times a year when they were doing uh, tax preparation work or the ultimate tax returns for the various um, companies. One thing that Donald Bender and Mazers knows is that Donald Trump has no qualms about throwing somebody under the bus. And I'm sure that their lawyer probably appropriately stated to them, if you don't get ahead of Trump, he'll get ahead of you. And he'll state that you are responsible because Donald is never responsible for anything. Nothing could ever be his fault. And that's why I'm also somewhat confused and Curious as to why Weisselberg hasn't now turned state's evidence, right? Why he's not cooperating with the attorney general and the DA's office, at least from the best of what I know. Because one thing that Donald will do is say, whoa, 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 what does this have to do with me? I have a CFO, even though Ivanka didn't know what role he played, which is just fucking hysterical. But he'll turn around and say, it had nothing to do with me. I just, I have people. I have, a, I have, you know, a CFO, and he was working with Donald Bender at Mazers. If there was an issue, they should have told me, and he will deflect upon them and leave them hanging, right, and to hold the responsibility. Well, it's interesting, Michael, isn't it? Because, as you say, Donald Trump um, is going to point the finger at somebody else, right, that you know best that that's his M.O. And until recently, until the last few days, he would have been able to say, wait a minute, I had a CFO, Alan Weisselberg, and I had a whole accounting firm, Mazars. Now, guess what? We're down to, to one, one person to blame, really, right? It's Weisselberg. Now that Mazars apparently has flipped, so does Weisselberg? You would know as, as well as anybody. I mean, have the sands not shifted under his feet? And shouldn't he also be trying to save himself and his family by flipping against Trump? I mean, if he wasn't such a fucking moron, the answer would be, of course, right? We do things in order to protect our family, right? I mean, most, I should say almost any parent that I know would turn around and put themselves at risk for their spouse and especially their children. Here, both Barry Weisselberg and Jack Weisselberg are in the crosshairs of the DA, that, you know, based upon Barry Weisselberg's failure to report income, which, of course, would be the apartments and so on. Plus, there's a whole bunch of funny monkey business that was going on with uh, cash collected over at Woman Rink and Lasker Rink and then the carousel. And then you have Jack Weisselberg, who was the conduit for the loans that the Trump organization received on behalf of some of their assets. I believe it was like 40 Wall Street. And the only other entity that loaned Trump money was Deutsche Bank. So obviously, Jack Weisselberg must have had something to do with the documents. I mean, Jack is the son of Allen. Who knows whether or not he did proper you know, due diligence uh, prior to giving that two, $300 million loan that they gave. Yeah, I, it doesn't make any sense to me, but you know, the way Trump conducts himself doesn't make any sense to me as a parent, as an American citizen. Um, and so, you know, these people are making decisions, you know, I, and it, it, it sort of, there's a parallel there with what I see from certain members of the Republican Party 
who make decisions. I mean, it used to be, I grew up in a fairly conservative household. My pop was a high school football coach in New Jersey. We didn't really do politics, but I think we lean more conservative than we lean liberal when I was a kid. And back then, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you know, nobody really cared. You believed one thing, you believed another. You believed bigger government, smaller government. You know, you believe strong foreign defense, you believe uh, restrained foreign defense. And people all kind of got along. And yet now what you see Republicans doing, it makes no sense to me because it has nothing to do with traditional conservative principles. It has everything to do with retaining power despite the potential destruction of our democracy. So what I try to ask myself, you know, I don't know that I'm a student of human nature, but I spent 30 years talking to juries. That's all I did as a prosecutor. I never wanted to go to the main Department of Justice and be a bureaucrat. That wasn't my thing. So, you know, you try to figure out what motivates people. And usually we understand protecting your family, retaining power, uh, acquiring wealth, right? But what would motivate Republicans to do what they've been doing? The only thing that makes any sense to me is that many of them are being compromised somehow. I mean, that's the only thing. When I look at a Lindsey Graham who says Donald Trump is the devil and then he plays around the golf with Donald Trump and he comes out the other side saying, Donald Trump is my man. What did Donald Trump say to him or show to him during that round of golf? that all of a sudden had him, you know, change on a dime. I don't know. It feels to me like people are so afraid of stepping away from Donald Trump because why? Because he has something on them or because it's just their desperate attempt to continue to curry favor with his base and retain power. I don't know. These are, these are curious times. My feeling is it's to curry, uh, to, you know, curry favor with his base. Uh, but what Trump has also taught the GOP, which is why one would say it's a zero sum game now in order for the Republicans to win. They have to kill the Democrats in order for Democrats to win. We have to kill the the GOP and people like, you know, the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Josh Hawley's, the Matt Gates's, the, the whole Ted Cruz's, all, all of them. And the way that Donald sort of taught them is to say bombastic and obnoxious things. I just want to go back and talk for a quick second about the ruling with the Attorney General, with Tish James, uh, as well as what's going on with the DA case here in New York. One of the things that Trump stated, and Fox picked up on it, Newsmax, OAN, your standard pallbearers of obnoxious, you know, um, bombastic rhetoric, is that the reason that Tish James... And now Alvin Bragg are doing what they're doing is because they're racists and that this entire investigation is racially motivated. I mean, if that's not the stupidest thing that you've ever heard, when I saw it, I, I said to myself, it's only Donald could come up with something that stupid, that bombastic, that obnoxious, and then to watch as so many of the GOP members and that Fox News sort of media, you know, outlet will just continue to promote that this is all based upon racism. Did you hear the same thing? Yeah, I heard it. And, you know, my gut reaction was yes, because, you know, rich, influential white men have traditionally been, you know, discriminated against through time, right? That's absurd. But the, but the second thing I thought of is, Unfortunately, that will resonate with some of Donald Trump's supporters, because if Donald Trump can make anybody who is attacking him um, seem like they're doing it from a place of prejudice, um, you know, then that will that will keep Donald Trump's base satisfied. It will continue to throw them the red meat that they need, because, listen, the only thing that Donald Trump sells effectively I'm even going to say he sells it well, is hate. He gives his base something to look down on. Somebody who is lower than you. Your life may be crap. I may not have improved your life one bit as president of the United States, but I'm giving you permission to hate. And you can look down on other people. And as bad as your life is, it's not as bad as 
the immigrants or the African Americans or frankly the women or the you know fill in the, the gays, you fill in the blank. Donald Trump gives people permission to hate. And that's really the only thing he sells well. Yeah, and he does it very well. But I want to just move on for a second because, Glenn, last week you tweeted, and I'm going to quote it, to be clear, if the DOJ fails to prosecute Trump and his corrupt associates for their many crimes, no future politician or high government official will have any reason whatsoever to obey the law. Such a failure will have a slouching toward the end of our republic. With with the New York State and possibly Fulton County, Georgia, first up to bat in taking on Trump, when do you think that the DOJ will finally step into the fray? I, I you know, it's impossible to predict. And let me tell you, every day, I don't want to misuse a medical term, Michael, but I feel schizophrenic because I'll feel hopeful and optimistic one minute because I'll see a development and then I'll be frustrated as all get out the next because it doesn't look like we're moving toward accountability fast enough. So, you know, and I come from the Department of Justice, nearly a quarter of a century after I left the army as a prosecutor, then I spent nearly a quarter of a century at the department. Um, I know the people, these are good people. And I, and I have been saying recently that there are too many good people at the Department of Justice to let Trump go uncharged. So I believe he will be charged. Um, my concern, and listen, I think they're going to put a big conspiracy case together, what we call a 371 conspiracy, a conspiracy to commit offenses against or defraud the United States. And that's what the conspiracy to overturn the election results constitutes. Um, and that's going to take a lot of time to put together. And I, I'll give them that. And I don't think we're going to see charges until probably after the House presentation of what the House Select Committee is finding gets broadcast, we see it in all its ugliness, and then I think we're likely to see indictments begin to drop. But I have a more fundamental concern with what the department is doing or declining to do. Michael, you know better than anybody how Donald Trump committed crimes to try to win the election, how he deprived us of the full value of our vote by hiding deeply damaging information about the man he was, in the campaign finance crimes that you paid for and he has yet to pay for. If we don't charge him for those, we are announcing to all future presidential candidates, you can do it too. The 10 obstruction of justice counts documented years ago by Bob Mueller in volume two of the Trump Russia report. If we don't charge him with those, we are saying the next president can do it all as well and get away with it. The bribery and extortion of President Zelensky, no small offense there. Donald Trump held on to congressionally appropriated funds and told President Zelensky, who desperately wanted and needed that money to protect his people from unlawful Russian aggression, Donald Trump said, no, I need a favor, though. I need you to lie about an investigation about my political opponent, Michael. If we don't hold him accountable for that, the next president gets to do it all over again. That's my current concern with the Department of Justice regarding those old offenses now, three, four, five years old. We all know the statute of limitations for most crimes is five years, unless it's, unless it's an ongoing crime, part of a conspiracy. Um, so I'm going to give them all the time they need to put the conspiracy case together for Donald Trump trying to steal the election, launching an insurrection, the, the fake electors, all of that, pressuring Mike Pence to do something he wasn't lawfully authorized to do. I know they need time to put all that together. But what about these crimes that we all know were committed that are screaming out for prosecution? Why aren't we seeing indictments in waves, right? Let's indict him for some of the earlier crimes while the department continues to investigate his attempt to overturn the election's results. Well, I'm not sure whether or not the Stormy Daniels campaign finance violation uh, that I ended up, you know, pleading guilty to. Um, I don't know whether or not that five year statute is up as of right this moment uh, or it's going to expire 
in the very, very near future. My question really to you is, when I heard that it was going to be Merrick Garland appointed as the Attorney General, I had such great high hopes for him because he comes with a stellar reputation, man of honor, integrity, but one of the problems is he just doesn't look like he wants to do anything. Oh, I don't want people to think, you know, that I'm partisan. Fuck that, right? It's enough already because you're so right, Glenn. If somebody doesn't do something and hold this man accountable for his own dirty deeds, then what happens to the Donald Trump 2.0? Because I say this on all, the, on all these podcasts. I say it on TV. and so I don't believe Trump is running. I'm actually sure that he will not run in 2024 but i'm not worried about him because he's too stupid even if he got into power his whole goal will be to stay as president for life and try to become the next vladimir putin and then he's going to go to war inside the united states with you know with congress my bigger fear is the next donald trump the donald trump 2.0 that actually has a brain that reads that knows how to really play with the system because they're taking Trump's playbook, which is has a lot of flaw, you know, faults uh, and flaws to it, but try to improve on it so that they get what they want. And that's really the destruction of our democracy. Yeah, and DeSantis is doing it right now. He's a little mini Trump. And here in Virginia, I'm right outside of D.C. Unfortunately, we have a mini DeSantis who's a mini Trump in this new knucklehead governor we have, um, Yunkin. But... Um, you know, and I, I have a question for you, which is, you know, you said you're not sure when the five years expires on the campaign finance violation and the conspiracy, I would say, to violate the campaign finance laws. And I remember, Michael, where you presented one of the checks that Donald Trump wrote to you to reimburse you. Um, and I don't remember the date on the check, but I think, you know, I don't know how long those payments continued. In the other words, a year, the full year. Do you remember so when the last check you got was? The, uh, yeah, so we, it was February of probably, it was January or February of 2018. Okay, so that would mean 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. So that to me, because that was an ongoing conspiracy in this old prosecutor's view, and so the five years wouldn't expire until January or February of 23, if I'm doing my math right. Well, you are. Um, and it w wasn't one check that I produced to Congress. It was actually 10 checks. Yeah. Um, okay. Which, yeah. And look, they have the goods. Now, what's interesting is I pled guilty to the campaign finance violation dealing with Karen McDougal as well, the Playboy Playmate. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had nothing to do with it. I had very little to do with it. I just looked over the agreement that was done between David Pecker and um, the National Enquirer with Karen McDougal. Now, I was going to buy her life rights. They were going to retain a portion so that they could continue to put her on the front cover for men's health and have her write um, a story. But that deal was done by David Pecker and others at the National Enquirer, yet they threw it all on me. And I'm writing a second book now, and I'm probably it may come out in April so uh, or so, called The Department of Injustice, where it's a, a, just a complete forensic dissection of my entire case, starting with that bullshit Steele dossier all the way to the unconstitutional remand of me back to prison because I refused to waive my First Amendment constitutional right. I mean, this is what Donald is doing. He's eroding our democracy a little bit a little bit, a little bit, a little bit at a time until ultimately, what do you end up with? You end up with like China, you end up with North Korea, you end up with Russia, with, with Saudi Arabia and so on. That's what Donald Trump wants. I mean, he knows he lost the election, but as I say often, his fragile ego would never allow him to acknowledge that. And instead of figuring out how to move on with his life, be a former president like all the other former presidents that are still, you know, with us. Do something good for the world. Use your, use your name recognition. Use your magatodes in order to do something good. That's not what he wants. He wants to burn the whole fucking country down because people didn't vote for him, because he lost. That's what he really wants to do.
Yeah, but you know what? He's going to get his. I, I took some comfort recently in what uh, Representative Jamie Raskin said. Um, you know, he is on the House Select Committee, and we know that they've conducted more than 500 interviews, and they've got, I mean, more documents than you can shake a stick at because the overwhelming majority of witnesses are fully cooperating with the House Select Committee's investigation into the Capitol attack. And it's really only this small batch of what I call the cover-up caucus, right? Meadows and Bannon and Jordan and Perry and, you know, uh, uh, Clark, Jeffrey Clark, who needs to get, he needs to get his, he needs to be prosecuted, and I think he will be. Um, talk about abusing the Department of Justice. Um, he tried to corrupt it and weaponize it to install Donald Trump unconstitutionally for a second term. The, so this cover-up caucus, this small little group of, uh, of traitors, you know, they're not cooperating. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people are. Jamie Raskin is privy to all that information. We're not yet until they do the public hearings. But what he said the other day, he said, you know, based on what I know, Donald Trump is an unabated crime wave. Donald Trump uh, is guilty as sin. These are quotes. And Donald Trump will get his legal comeuppance. Not a word I would use. I'm a Jersey guy. I would have used a different word than comeuppance. <laughs> but Jamie Raskin is a constitutional scholar. Um, so you know what? He has a basis of knowledge based on his position on the House Select Committee that we don't have. And he, in the strongest possible terms, said Donald Trump will get his. He will be held accountable. So now we so, unfortunately so are Glenn, all left to wait. So, Glenn, if I, if I can, if I can, because I know right now my listeners are thinking the same thing that I'm listening, that I'm thinking. So what's taking so long? You're right. They have now interviewed over 500 people. And I've been before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, the Senate Select Committee, the House Judiciary, the House Oversight Committee. And each and every time I was before them, it was no less than nine hours. That's 4,500 hours of straight testimony with tens and tens and tens of thousands of documents. You're talking about like 160 some odd days of testimony straight, 24 seven. If they don't have enough right now to walk into Merrick Garland's office and say, come on, come on, man, right? Seriously, right? Then what? Then what? How many more people need to testify, you know, before which that they actually have the ironclad case that they're looking for? You know, politicians and political committees move at a glacial pace. <laughs> the true. Department of Justice, let me tell you. <laughs> there Not are on 94... my case, Glenn. What's Not that? on my case. Not on my case. They moved Mine quickly moved on you? 48 hours from a Friday at 5.30 p.m. to a Monday. If I didn't plead guilty, they were filing an 85-page indictment against me that was going to include my wife. Yeah, and, here, and here's the problem. So let me, let me amend what I said. They can move quickly when they want to. And, mm -hmm. you know, the, I'll use an example of that, that uh, federal government employee down in Hawaii who was just prosecuted for wrongfully removing classified information. Secret, mind you, not top secret. Uh, her name is, uh, I forget her name. Um, it'll come to me. It, the DOJ did a splashy press release about it. On the same day, we learned Donald Trump had classified materials at Mar-a-Lago unlawfully, and they moved on her. What did they do? They executed a search warrant to get the information that she had, that she had wrongfully removed. They charged her, and she's now serving a three-month sentence and a $5,500 fine. I know that doesn't sound like a lot, but you, as well as anybody know, knows even one day in jail or in prison is too darn much if, if you don't have to serve it. And yet that's the way they went after her. What did they do when they realized Donald Trump had classified information at Mar-a-Lago? They negotiated with him for a year rather than doing what I would have done, I can promise you, marched into a judge's chambers with an application for a search warrant for Mar-a-Lago and gone in and retrieved the evidence of Donald Trump's crimes. Because there are three separate federal statutes Donald Trump violated, the Presidential Crimes Act, mishandling of classified material and removal, destruction, or mutilation of documents. And yet, 
our federal government responded to that obvious crime by negotiating with him for a year to try to, like he's like, we're negotiating with a document terrorist. That, that is a real beef I have with the way they're handling Donald Trump and his crimes as compared to how they handle the crimes of others. Yep, so I think the, the woman's name is Asia Lavarello. Uh, Lavarello, right. right. And um, look, look what they did to Reality Winner. The same thing, one document, she got what, seven years or something like that. Nobody negotiated with her. Nobody negotiated with Lavarello uh, and so on. And you're right, it's despicable. But you know, I wanna just, I wanna play devil's advocate for a second because on the flip side, if the DOJ never prosecutes Trump for January 6th, what do you see as the fallout and the future repercussions? Do you, does, it, does it normalize sedition and political violence? What do you think comes out of it? It's the end of our republic, period, full stop. Why? Because no future elected official, no future high executive branch official will have to obey the law because they have now been given permission to commit whatever crime they want to enrich themselves, to retain power unlawfully and unconstitutionally, and they know there will be no repercussions. So why wouldn't they commit crimes to retain power precisely as Donald Trump did? You know, the only way to deter future crime is by prosecuting present crime. And if Donald Trump goes unprosecuted, I believe that spells the end of our republic. And I don't believe the folks at the Department of Justice are, are up for being tacitly involved in ending the republic by giving Donald Trump a pass. I, I just don't see that happening. Yeah, I, look, I don't see... I don't see what they see, and I'm, I struggle day in and day out to try to understand what these GOP members that are backing Donald blindly, and instead of them looking to see what he's done to me, look at what he's even doing to Rudy Colludi Giuliani, right, who I was just in the newspaper because we happened to be dining at the same restaurant, and it was like you can cut the tension right in the air. Look, he's going to throw him under the bus, too. And he'll throw Alan Weisselberg under the bus. And he's going to throw Mazers under the bus. And Donald Bender, each and every one of them, including his own children. You know, and I talk about it in my book, Disloyal, where I said, if in fact that Cy Vance ended up prosecuting uh, the Trump organization, Don and Ivanka, for the Trump Soho project for lying and for um, misstating facts to the public, one of the things Donald said is if either if it, we can make a deal that it's one or the other, make sure that it's Don Jr. I mean, this is what goes on inside this man's head. But, you know, I want to say something to you about this. Glenn. I saw you on MSNBC last week. It's one of the reasons why I wanted you to come on today to talk about it, because you said something that really um, it really shocked me that nobody wants to be the first to prosecute Donald Trump. But everyone will want to be second. And I thought that was an amazingly insightful comment that came out of your mouth. If you would do me the favor and my listeners, can you unpack what you meant there and how that will manifest in the ongoing investigation of Donald Trump, the Trump organization? Uh, you still got Weisselberg up there in the batter's box. We now have Don, Ivanka. We know that Eric Trump has been before the grand jury already, took the fifth 500 times. Yeah, so let me, uh, and this will also help answer the, the question, why does it take DOJ so long, right? The federal prosecutors have the luxury of time in almost every investigation because they investigate proactively, meaning before an arrest has ever been made, they open up a grand jury, they start presenting evidence and witnesses at their leisure, and they try to build a bulletproof case. Sometimes that takes months or years. And then when they're at the end of their investigation, they make a decision. How strong is the case? The first thing they try to do is negotiate a pre-indictment guilty plea and wrap it all up in a nice bow. And it never is on the court clock. They completely control the time frame. They operate under no deadlines. They are proactive investigators. If they can't negotiate a pre-indictment guilty plea by the person they've been investigating ad nauseum, 
then they have a decision to make. Do we indict the case and go to trial? Is it bulletproof? Or can we look at it and find some sort of weakness that gives us pause? And if they, in other words, do we run the risk of losing at trial and being embarrassed? If they find a weakness, they don't have to indict. Why do you think there's this perception that the feds have 100% conviction rate? They have almost complete control over who they indict and who they don't. If they don't indict, you know what they can always do? Kick it to the states. Because when somebody commits a crime, a federal crime, that is a crime with a federal jurisdictional hook, the feds swoop in and say, is this the kind of case we want to take or should we just let the feds handle it? Because when you commit a federal crime, nine times out of 10, you're also committing a local crime in violation of state laws. And that's why my friend Claire McCaskill always says, state prosecutors answer 911 calls all day, every day. They're in court pumping cases. Federal prosecutors don't. They have the luxury of time. And Michael, that is, and I'm, I'm trying not to beat up on my brother and sister federal prosecutors. That is, it's in the DNA of the DOJ to do these long, slow, methodical, overarching ad nauseum investigations. That's what I believe is being done right now on the insurrection front. Now, mind you, they've already indicted hundreds of people and there are lots more to come but they haven't made their way up to the next rung of the criminal ladder. They haven't gone after the command structure of the insurrection yet, um, but I'm hopeful that they're gonna get there. So, and now, now bring me back to your original question because my train is off track. If you would unpack, you know, what you oh, meant yeah. with the, um, you know, first to prosecute Donald, gotcha. but everyone thereafter, you know, the second will be a multitude a multitude of investigations and indictments. So no, no prosecutor likes the idea of going into court and losing a case. I didn't care. I'm a gutter kid from Jersey. I've been in lots of scrapes. I've been knocked down. I've lost plenty. I mean, I like to think I'm no Michael Jordan, but I love his quote. I've lost, oh, I failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. But federal prosecutors really don't like to walk in if there's a risk that they might lose a trial. Uh, state prosecutors are a little bit more comfortable with that. But what every prosecutor in the country knows is that the first one to charge a former president criminally will have the white hot attention of not only the national media, but the world media. And that is going to take a really strong prosecution team to step up and say, we don't care. We have the evidence and it's the right thing to do. Once one prosecutor breaks that barrier, I predict every other prosecutor who has the goods on Donald Trump, and let me tell you, Michael, as an old homicide prosecutor in D.C., he could be charged with avoidable COVID deaths in all 50 states and in the territories. I, and we could go through the three elements of involuntary manslaughter that are easily satisfied by Donald Trump's conduct of lying to the American people and endangering us all. Every prosecutor is going to want to be the second once the barrier is broken, because then they're going to look bad. Because then they're going to be like, ooh, well, I have the goods against Trump, too. So if I don't bring charges, I'm not protecting the citizens of my jurisdiction. So that's why I think once the barrier is broken, the dominoes are going to fall. Yeah, and I'm going to be a little more cynical than you. I don't think that they care about the citizens of their of their community, of the state, and so on. I think that they're more they're more concerned about their future, about going to these white shoe firms, you know, like the Davis Polks, the McDermott, Will and Emery's, Lowenstein Sandler's, and so on. Just like the federal prosecutors, you know, there's nine people that claim that they had done work on my case. I pled guilty to a one page information, but yet there's nine people. One guy went to Guggenheim Partners. I mean, simply the very first tagline in their bio successfully prosecuted you know biggest 21st century case of u.s versus Cohen. they give more they they only give a shit about their future salaries and their incomes so that they could add another thousand square feet you know to their hampton houses or what have you i have no faith in any of them at this at this point in time well let me tell you um, i understand given your experience i mean given that you you know you're one of the only people i know who ever successfully filed the great writ the writ of habeas corpus, and you convinced the federal judge that you were being detained unlawfully 
by the by the uh, federal government, which you were certainly based on everything I saw, and a federal judge ruled you were. I mean, so that you know your experience obviously informs how you feel about prosecutors, and I get that. And I, uh, but let me just say, from being on the inside for thirty years, there are so darn many good, honorable, honest prosecutors who work their tails off night and day for the American people, or if they're state prosecutors for the citizens of their jurisdiction. And then there are the ones that you describe, the people who run around beating their chest about, I handled the biggest case ever, and I never lost the case, members of what Jim Comey called the chicken shit club. And they go out and they sell that little bit of experience that they try to blow up into something so they can line their own pockets. There are those kind of prosecutors too. But just like in the defense bar, just like on the bench, we got the good, the bad, and the ugly. We've got them in the prosecutorial world too, but we got a lot of good. Yeah, there was like that old expression, right? One bad apple spoils the bunch. What about 10 of them? Fucking rotten to the core. I look at what they end up destroying. They end up destroying you know, America's belief system in our Department of Justice. And let's hope that the guys that you're referring to, the honorable ones that care more about doing the right thing than they're lining their own pocket with a cushy job down the road. Let's hope that they, there's more of them than, you know, than the others. But I want to ask you this because Donald also brought something up that I thought was kind of astute for somebody as stupid as he is. He brought up that, you know, when it's going to actually come to prosecuting him, how do you even begin to first find a fair and an impartial jury? And second, to make a case that sticks. If you would do me a favor, because you obviously have many years, you know, of experience here. Walk me through how you would make the case against Donald Trump. Yeah. So interesting. Yesterday, I put up a video on my Justice Matters channel on YouTube, which is how do we select a fair jury to try Donald Trump? once he is indicted, and he will be indicted. Today, I taught that same topic to my criminal justice students at George Washington University. So the, the, the things are, you know, the issues are aligning at the moment. So, you know, I've been involved in a lot of high stakes jury selection. No, not high stakes like charging or trying a former president, but I participated in the RICO trials of the biggest gang in the history of DC. So, you know, we went through a very lengthy jury selection process. We give the jurors a questionnaire that spans about 120 questions, and then we spend lots of one-on-one -on -one quality time with each juror to see if they can truly sit as a fair and impartial jury, even understanding that they all have preconceived notions, they have ideological preferences, they have uh, 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 political affiliations, but the key is, you have to look them in the eye and talk to them for a long time and try to determine whether they can set those things aside and decide the case based only on the evidence they see introduced during the course of the trial. And I always use the Manafort trial as an example. We had a self-proclaimed MAGA hat wearing Trump supporter, a true believer who said every day I came to the courthouse, I took my MAGA hat off. I left it in the car. I sat in the jury box. I wanted Paul Manafort to be not guilty. And I will, I will vote for Trump in 2020 if he runs. And I thought the prosecutors went after Manafort to try to get dirt on Donald Trump. And then she voted guilty at the end of it all because she said, notwithstanding my own personal political and ideological beliefs, the evidence was overwhelming and it proved his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt to my satisfaction. That is a much smaller stage in a criminal trial than we would have in a trial of Donald Trump. But I believe in my 30 years as a prosecutor, we can pick a fair jury. And here's the other thing that's available to the parties, the prosecution and the defense now that was not available back when I started in the 80s as a prosecutor. There was no internet. There was no DNA evidence for that matter. Um, there is a social media footprint that pretty much anybody has, right? So people can actually take the names of the jurors and find out a little bit about them because if they're coming in with a nefarious objective, I'm going to hide my true feelings about a prosecution of Donald Trump and I'm going to try to get in that jury box and then I'm going to vote one way or another, either because I love them or I hate them, right? I think, it, it, first of all, the jurors would have to lie to the judge during voir dire, during individual jury questioning about their fitness to serve, 
and they're probably going to get caught because if you're the kind of person who feels that strongly, you're going to have a social footprint and you're going to get found out one way or another. I am optimistic. You know, I say about juries, about our jury system, what I say, what people say about democracy, it's probably the worst system of a criminal justice system, but for all the others. So I'm still a believer in the jury system. And I think we can do it for Donald Trump. And you know what? He didn't give us a fair trial as president, but we're going to give him a fair trial as a criminal defendant. You know, I said on MSNBC, I think it was with Alex Witt, that I don't want to see Donald Trump go to prison simply because I despise him or simply because I fundamentally disagree with virtually everything that comes out of his mouth. I want to see him held responsible for his dirty deeds, for his crimes. And that's what I would hope, as you, as you do, um, we'd be able to figure out during voir dire. But let me just move on for a second, and let's talk about how Trump may or may not use his Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself. Because from what I understand, in the New York City deposition uh, pleading, the Fifth can actually land him in deeper legal jeopardy. Am I correct about that? Yeah, so it depends on whether we're talking about invoking the fifth in a civil matter or in a criminal matter. So he's going to be made to sit for a deposition. Judge uh, Engeron has made that clear. He can try to appeal to the New York Court of Appeals. They're going to shoot him down. So, And then I can't imagine, Michael, his lawyers will let him utter a word. They may have to staple his lips shut to keep him from wanting to say something. He will plead the fifth. He might break Eric Trump's record of, of more than 500 times. He may plead the fifth a thousand times. What happens once he pleads the fifth? Well, when the civil fraud case, which will undoubtedly be brought against Trump and his organization, goes to trial, the jury will be instructed. Ladies and gentlemen, during a deposition, Donald Trump pled his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination a thousand times. You may use that against him and draw negative inferences about how you should rule in this case. So it will crush him in the civil case. He's going to be a pauper by then anyway, and, but it will go the way of the Trump uh, a charity and the Trump University. You know, it, the Trump organization, I believe, will go belly up. But you can never use in a criminal trial the fact that somebody invoked their Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, even if they did it in a civil deposition, as opposed to in front of a grand jury, because you have a constitutional right against self-incrimination, which means a criminal trial. In a civil case, it's fair game. Right. And let's not forget how many times he attacked Hillary Clinton and others, that only the mob takes the fifth, the only time you take the fifth if you're guilty. You see, that's the problem with Donald. Donald doesn't read. I mean, when he reads the newspaper, you ever saw him when sometimes he would travel uh, commercial down to Palm Beach, Florida, but he would go with a stack of like 30 newspapers, right? The genius, he's going to spend his next three and a half hours on that flight reading. It's not true. He's basically scouring the newspaper for his name to see what articles are written that contain his name, basically, again, to blow up his already bloviated ego, right? And I mean, that's just what that's just what he does. He's not reading for the news. He's not reading to learn something. He's basically reading just to see himself, you know, being mentioned. Now, you also bring up something which I found absolutely astonishing, which is that you think he will beat Eric's 500 um, pleading of the fifth, f at least 500 times. And I agree with you. I don't think other than answering a handful of questions about his name uh, and the uh, CEO of the Trump organization and so on, you know, there's no doubt that he's going to take the fifth on every other question thereafter, because there's absolutely a 1000% chance. Now, I know people say, yeah, how could you have a thousand? You can't have more than 100%. No, no. With Donald Trump, it's a thousand percent chance that if, in fact, that he testifies, he perjures himself during these depositions. I've seen him do it before. I've seen Eric do it. Listen, I'm suing the Trump organization for my legal fees on the whole Stormy Daniels and so on matter. And I have, in our deposition, Eric lied. I mean, in Ivanka's deposition for a different case, she didn't even know who Alan Weisselberg was, the 45-year CFO of the Trump Organization that's been with Donald longer than she's alive. If he's found to have lied under oath, 
Do you think that they'll prosecute him immediately for at least that? I think it's a thousand, uh, a thousand and one violation. I mean, how does that work? Yeah, so the 1001 violation is a reference to the federal code, 18 U.S.C. 1001 false official statements to Congress, to the FBI, to any number of, of people. Um, but in the Tish James civil matter, it would be in violation of what, whatever the New York statute is prohibiting lying in that, that setting. But here's the dirty secret about depositions. They're conducted a thousand times a day in every jurisdiction of the country. Almost nobody is ever prosecuted for lying at a deposition. The consequences more typically for lying at a civil deposition is you're going to lose the trial and it's going to force you to settle because your lies are going to be exposed by your opponent. But let me tell you, Michael, I presented people to the grand jury all day, every day for decades, not all day, every day, but frequently. We had a very high volume business when I was a federal prosecutor at the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. My witnesses, I begged and pleaded and tried to impress upon them the importance of telling the truth to the grand jury. You know how many lied? A lot. I had to decide who I had the federal interest, the compelling interest in prosecuting for those perjury charges, for those perjury crimes in the grand jury. And I'm going to tell you, I only brought a handful of them. Why? Because I had my hands full prosecuting the murderers and the carjackers and the rapists and the RICO gang members. And you don't have the luxury of time to prosecute 100 perjury cases. But if it's a really important perjury and you needed to do it to further your investigation or you needed to do it as a matter of principle, you did it. The reality is, even in um, grand jury settings, perjury rarely gets prosecuted. In the context of a civil deposition, I hate to burst anybody's bubble, it ain't going to happen. Nobody's prosecuted for perjury when they lie in a civil deposition, but there are other consequences. Right. You know, what's interesting, going back to my case and you know, some of my fans, the supporters and listeners of the show, uh, they enjoy because I tried to bring it back to how crazy the whole the whole Donald Trump tenure was. It's amazing that when they were prosecuting me, the federal prosecutors at the Southern District of New York came to suspect and CNN is the one. Kara Skinnell, I believe, is the one that broke the story. They came to suspect that Alan Weisselberg, the CFO of the Trump Organization, lied about his testimony about me to the grand jury. They considered charging him with perjury, decided not to charge him with perjury, rather gave him limited immunity and allowed him to go before the grand jury with that lie that they knew. How does something like that happen? I mean, I'm only curious because, as I told you, I'm writing a book uh, that hopefully will come out around April called The Department of Injustice. And I can't figure out, because I can't really speak to nobody's willing to give me the answer to this. How is it that they can do something like that? How is it that if you know as a prosecutor that the guy's lying to you, not only do you forgive the lie, but you give him immunity from it and you put him before the grand jury to promote that lie? So I can only speak to the way I did business. And I, I actually was known as the king of the cooperating witnesses at the D.C. U.S. Attorney's Office. And mind you, that was not a, a positive term. That was people are like, yeah, you're, you, you, you're sponsoring cooperating witnesses all the time. And I would say yes, because I needed to do that to make inroads e to, into even worse criminals. Right. But when I worked with a, an aspiring cooperating witness, I had a standard spiel, Michael, and I said, if you don't tell me the full truth, warts and all, even things that you think may hurt my investigation into the guy that I'm trying to indict, I will jump on you with both feet, though that's not the term I used. And I did everything I could to impress upon my witnesses slash aspiring cooperators that I can deal with the truth no matter who it implicates or who it exonerates, no matter how it helps or hurts my case. But dude, it's got to be the truth because if you give me a lie, even a little lie, even a lie that you think will help me get the guy I'm trying to get, I can't use you. 
Not only can I not use you, I will hurt you in court in your own case. Do we understand one another? Now, that doesn't mean these people didn't sometimes lie to me. But when I caught them in a lie, that largely would render themselves useless to me as a witness because I can't sponsor the testimony of a liar. Now, Michael, sometimes I would catch them in a lie and I'd have to go back to them with their counsel and say, now we caught you in a lie. Now you've hurt your own cause and your own credibility. Do you want to clean it up or do you want to be done in this relationship with the prosecutors? Sometimes they cleaned it up. And that was how I could continue to do business with them if they cleaned it up. Sometimes they couldn't clean it up. Sometimes they lied to me so much that I had to walk away from them. But it's not, it's an art, not a science. And it's not a one size fits all proposition. Yeah, but I think the Southern District were the ones that were promoting him to tell the lie. That's what it appears to me. That's um, some of the information that will be um, forthcoming in the book, believe it or not. They actually promoted him to tell the lie. But, you know, Glenn, just moving forward for a sec. Let's talk about what Judge Maida said about Trump in relation to the January 6th lawsuits. I'm curious if you can walk my listeners through his statements and what struck you as the most particularly noteworthy. Well, well which one just stood out ab far and above the others? It was that Donald Trump's conduct was the essence of civil conspiracy. I mean, that is a devastating thing for a federal judge to say about a former president. And, you know, he also said that, you know, you were using the term we, we are going to now march down on the Capitol. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. The, I mean, Judge Mehta called this out for what it was. It was inciting violence at the Capitol in order to unlawfully retain power. And this is the first legal opinion ever allowing a lawsuit like this to go forward against a former president of the United States. The judge determined that none of this was within the scope of his official duties as president. In fact, he said it was all outside the scope of his official duties as president. And that's why this suit will continue against him and it will go to discovery. Now, I think once he's criminally indicted, the civil suit is going to take a backseat because anytime somebody gets indicted criminally, all of these civil suits end up being stayed. They take a backseat to the criminal prosecution. That's the way the prosecutors want it. That's generally the way the defense attorneys want it too, because they don't want their client exposed to a whole bunch of depositions when they're now facing criminal charges. So, but I mean, this is a, it's a, just a dramatic ruling, 112 page ruling by Judge Mehta. But what impressed me most was that his conduct is the essence of a civil conspiracy. I would go one step further and say, it's also the essence of a criminal conspiracy. Former US Attorney Barb McQuaid, very thoughtful, smart, circumspect, measured, former career prosecutor, did what we call a prosecution memo. It was published today, or we called it a CIM, a case impression memo. And what, what that is, before a prosecutor indicts a case, we have to draft a pros memo that lays out everything, all the facts and all the law, and then reaches a decision, either we should proceed with a prosecution or not. Barb laid that out in about 20 some odd pages. Um, I recommend it as, as reading, just go to her Twitter feed and it's right near the top. And she reaches the conclusion that Donald Trump absolutely should be prosecuted for a conspiracy to commit offenses against or defraud the United States for his pressure campaign on Pence and everything that involved in trying to unlawfully overturn the election's results. It's, it's great reading from a really strong legal, uh, legal mind. You know, for me, the thing I found interesting about uh, Judge Maida's uh, decision is that um, he decided to dismiss Rudy Giuliani and Don Trump Jr.'s, um, uh, who were named as co-defendants in, in that lawsuit. I thought it was very interesting, but yet, you know, held on to Donald um, mostly because he was in the position of power, and they, of course, were not. But, you know, Glenn, as I said to you at the very beginning, the hour goes by really, really quickly, so I have one last question for you. If you would, let's talk about the documents that turned up at Mar-a-Lago. 
I mean, this is just another crime in and of itself. First of all, I'm very curious as to who it was that packed up the boxes. Rest assured, it wasn't Donald. How did those boxes end up getting to Mar-a-Lago? But my real question to you as a former prosecutor, is this a, prosecu um, a prosecutable offense? And if so, do Trump's actions merit investigation here as well? Because one thing that we know, just like, three dozen investigations that are all swirling around in this Trumpism sphere, right? I mean, is this going to do anything? Does it make sense for them to investigate it? Is this a crime? Um, yes, it must be investigated. And today, I believe Merrick Garland put out a statement that he has received the criminal referral from the National Archives and Say it with me now, they will follow the facts and follow the law wherever they lead. That is nothing more than a prosecutor saying, today I'm going to breathe in, then I'm going to breathe out, then I'm going to breathe in again. That's what we do. We follow the facts and we follow the law. The, the more fundamental question, given where we are as a nation, is when you follow the facts and you follow the law, and it all supports a prosecution, how long do we have to wait before you bring those charges? But to answer your question, it needs to be investigated. It certainly on, on the surface looks like it violates three separate federal statutes. The Presidential Records Act, which is not a criminal statute, and the, it's a largely toothless federal law. Um, the, the prohibition, the legal prohibition against um, removing, mutilating, destroying documents, president, uh, not presidential, but official government documents. And probably most importantly, um, mishandling of classified materials. It seems to fit the bill for all three of those federal statutes. Has to be investigated, should have been investigated differently. Search warrants should have been conducted the minute the federal government knew Donald Trump and his people at Mar-a-Lago were in possession of evidence of crime just like they did a search warrant on Rudy Giuliani's 18 electronic devices because a federal judge concluded there was probable cause to believe there was evidence of crime in Rudy's electronic devices. Similarly, a search warrant should have been executed at Mar-a-Lago. It wasn't. I'm hoping this is not too little too late. Uh, there will probably be plenty of liability to go around because as you say, who packed up those boxes? So who was part and parcel of violating those federal statutes? That's what an investigation is needed for. But you have to believe, Michael, that Donald Trump was at least directing the band at some point like, no, I want this stuff down there. Why? Well, do we think Donald Trump might um, mishandle classified information for his own financial gain? How, how could we conclude he wouldn't? I mean, the man is a walking national security risk. And the fact that we negotiated with him for a year while we gave him the opportunity to make copies of anything he wanted, sell them to our adversaries, destroy them, flush them down the toilet, do whatever. You know, that's why you don't handle these crimes differently than you would handle it if you or me mishandled national security information. If you and I ever did anything, one tenth of what Donald had done, we'd be looking at three life sentences. All right. Look, you know, I know this from personal experience. They're just pussyfooting with him uh, just too much. It's just anything that he does. And one thing that we really have to be concerned about is the upcoming midterm elections, because rest assured, if and when the GOP becomes dominant in the in the House, um, God forbid, in the Senate as well, we're going to have a real tough time in terms of prosecuting, because I believe that the, that he still controls enough of the sycophantic followers that need to use him for his base in order to wiggle once again out of his liability. Uh, Glenn, let me thank you for enlightening us. Let me thank you for your time. Uh, justice matters. It most certainly does. Uh, people should go to your site as well. And um, thank you for just being a voice there uh, of positivity. Thanks, Michael. My pleasure. Be well. Good to see you. You too.